Welcome to the Logger Lecture Series, named after McMaster graduate Albert Abram Logger, a great believer in the value of lifelong education. He created the Albert Abram Logger Foundation, which supports several organizations in their efforts, including the McMaster Alumni Association. The United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, are a call to action to end poverty and hunger, protect the planet, and ensure healthy lives, peace, and prosperity by the year 2030. At McMaster, we recognize our responsibility to address these goals as we work together across disciplines and faculties, locally and globally, to create a healthier, brighter world. In 2022, our online Logger Lecture Series will feature talks by McMaster researchers, projects, groups, and alumni to showcase how McMaster is helping to reach these goals. Good evening and welcome to this Logger Lecture Online. My name is Jessica Lounsbury and I work in the Office of Alumni Engagement here at McMaster. Over the next two years, our Logger Lecture Series will feature webinars on, on talks of some of the research taking place at McMaster that is helping reach the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals and their targets. This evening's lecture will focus on Sustainable Development Goal number 11, which is Sustainable Cities and Communities, and specifically Sustainable Transport Systems. Our guest speaker this evening is Dr. Motaz Mohammed. Dr. Mohammed graduated from the Faculty of Engineering at Siyat University, Egypt in 2004. He was awarded his master's degree from the University of Rome, La Sapienza in 2007, and his PhD degree from the University of Ulster, United Kingdom in 2012. Dr. Mohammed has been a member of the McMaster community since 2014 as a postdoctoral fellow in the McMaster Institute for Transportation and Logistics and as assistant professor in McMaster's Department of Civil Engineering. His research focuses on the systemic evaluation of transportation networks to achieve sustainable and resilient transportation systems, and he's a strong believer of zero emissions, sustainable, resilient transit systems. If you have a question for Dr. Mohammed this evening, please type it in using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will have some time at the end to answer a few questions. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Dr. Motaz Mohammed. Perfect. Thank you, Jessica, for uh, for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone, and uh, uh, good good evening for people participating in our time zone. And uh, good morning, and uh, or good day for everyone participating on a different time zone. So uh, today, mainly, it's uh, it's just a reflection of uh, uh, the effort that we do at McMaster to advance the implementation of uh, sustainable uh, mobility with a specific focus on sustainable electric mobility solution. And the reason for calling this transportation renaissance that the transportation system at large is witnessing its second uh, major uh, like paradigm shift in terms of up upgrading powertrain technology, upgrading transportation uh, modes, delivery system, logistics. So a lot of research taking place currently at the transportation which will impact our uh, daily life and the way cities will grow in the future. So uh, this presentation will not be possible without uh, my team members at uh, the Trip Lab. So all credit uh, to them. Uh, it's a collaborative work, and actually they do all the like the, the like the heavy lifting and all the analytics and everything. So I don't want to start mentioning names, but in total uh, twelve. Uh, brilliant young scholars that actually contribute almost 100% of the material that I will share with you today. So the, just to, to, to make sure that we align, I will speak first a little bit about what I do at McMaster and then about the scope of, of my presentation. And then we will jump into the three main domains that I will discuss today, electric vehicles, electric transit, and autonomous uh, drones or uh, unmanned aerial vehicles for parcel delivery. So I joined McMaster in 2014. Uh, I was appointed at the Department uh, of Civil Engineering in uh, July 2017, currently at the rank of uh, assistant professor. And um, I, I can share with you that I just received my promotion for associate professor, effective July 22. Uh, since I joined uh, engineering, I raised almost 1.2 million in terms of uh, research fund and again, all the credit uh, goes to my uh, the team members that actually uh, working very hard to advance our, I call it community service, 
to share our research and knowledge with uh, like the, the Hamilton community, the Canadian community, and the international community. So before I go into uh, like the details of my presentation, and if you don't mind, uh, if you have a phone uh, uh, like in front of you or you have internet access, you can go into www.menti.com and use the code 18406742. And the key idea, I just want to understand uh, like the distribution of the audience in, in order to tailor the presentation based on the majority of uh, the audience today, because it's too huge of a topic to focus only on the industry or to include all three of them at the same time. So we can give it a couple of minutes and then we can actually uh, take it from there. And uh, I, I like Mentimeter, it's, it's super cool because the results will be updated live during the presentation. So I use this during my teaching all the time. So I'll give it like 30 more seconds and then we, we can actually go into the agenda. Okay, so we have the transportation industry or the industry at, at large is, uh, is taking the lead and also R&D is almost equally. And this is the, the, hard, the hard part that you have all three categories are actually tied with almost the same percentage, but uh, let's see. So 25 out of uh, 86, this should be a reasonable sample. So scope and narrative. Uh, because as defined by uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goal, sustainable transportation system include a lot of parameters and by no means I'm trying to address all of them at once. I'm trying to do my part to address some of these parameters in collaboration with other scholars and with collaboration with uh, my team members. However, I'm very open uh, to collaboration. I'm very open to ideas and I'm very open to expand the portfolio of my research to include all the remaining items. So as defined by uh, the United Nations Sustainable uh, uh, Transportation System and include economical uh, uh, or economy parameters, environmental parameters, social equity, health, resilience, and uh, uh, urban rural linkages and productivity. My research mainly focus on the economy part of, uh, of sustainable development not from an economic perspective, it's mainly related to the feasibility of implementation and the total cost of ownership. For sure, we're doing a lot of research related to environment, wheel to wheel greenhouse gas emission, air pollutant, and all the portfolio with environmental impact assessment, social equity in terms of accessibility to fund and incentive, health impact, which uh, to, to a great extent is a byproduct of the environmental impact. And we are currently starting our quest to look into uh, uh, city re robustness and the resilience of our city. So the talk today will focus mainly on uh, goal number 11 and specifically 11.2, which is affordable and sustainable transportation systems. So when we look into electric mobility, we need to uh, acknowledge that we are speaking about two different components, not only electric mobility, any transportation system, you have uh, so many uh, uh, components, infrastructure, and the asset, which is the vehicle and the energy pathway. However, when we are transitioning to electric mobility, the majority of the focus is mainly not related to the infrastructure component uh, uh, per se, but it's mainly related to the vehicle and energy. So people always question what's the energy pathway and the um, like emission coming from the uh, utility grid that will feed your electric mobility solution and what's the uh, cradle to grave or wheel to wheel greenhouse gas emission for the vehicle. So if at, at very high level, if we slice the process of providing electric mobility solutions into our uh, transportation system, we can bring them into three different uh, stages, the manufacturing process, the utilization process and end of life process. 
Within each stage, you have four major players that have interdependent relationship and they will impact each other significantly in identifying the true costs and benefits of your electric mobility solution. And these are the policies, what's the political environment and the political atmosphere, stakeholders at play, the process that you implement in order, uh, the process that you choose in order to implement your electric mobility solution and external factors. And you, we can give so many examples about these four pillars. So policies, political uh, orientation. I remember when uh, uh, President Trump was elected and he lifted the environmental ban on coal-based uh, coal uh, electricity generation. All of a sudden the sales of uh, electric vehicles dropped and electric vehicles were viewed at this time as shifting the emission from one place to another place. Uh, we hear a lot of uh, uh, a lot of papers coming out uh, questioning the mining practices for uh, the minerals used for lithium ion batteries. What's the energy pathway if you are using hydrogen fuel cell? Are you transporting hydrogen on trucks or pipeline or renewable based hydrogen production? Uh, do you have natural resources or you are importing and how this might impact your workforce, your, your economic productivity and your economic growth? So all these four pillars will actually play major parts in the manufacturing process, the utilization process and the end of life process. And by no means I have the capacity to understand and research all of them. So my research mainly focuses on the utilization piece of uh, electric mobility with three major uh, items, electric vehicles, electric bus, and this is the main, the main piece of my research, and electric uh, battery, electric uh, drones for last mile parcel delivery. So the second question, which uh, again, this is a very common question that people will ask, why electric mobility? Uh, if you produce electricity from uh, dirty sources, basically you are shifting emission. So this is why I love Christopher Kennedy's uh, research, which was published in Nature in 2015, actually looking into what's the optimal electricity uh, or emission thresholds coming from the electricity for electric mobility solution to be environmentally friendly. And as you can see here, the gray zone marks the area between 500 uh, tons CO2 equivalent per gigawatt hour electricity produced up to 700. So I call it the magic number. So if you are within this zone, it's kind of a tie game. So your electric vehicle is producing the same emission as uh, uh, like a uh, internal combustion engine. If you are below the 500 mark, you're actually contributing to lower greenhouse gas emission. So if we look at Canada, at the national level, we speak about uh, uh, 212 uh, ton CO2 equivalent for each uh, gigawatt hour electricity we produce. So this is the national average. I know that provincial level, uh, we will fluctuate, but even the most emission intensive province in Canada is far away from the 500 uh, uh, mark. Therefore, we can confidently say that in Canada, electric mobility solution uh, solutions make a lot of sense because we are actually reducing the wheel to wheel greenhouse gas emission at the entire utilization uh, part of the vehicle. The second one uh, that people will question or the second major question uh, in the literature is actually about vehicle emission. And I, I, I'm not in favor of looking at vehicle emission because vehicle is an asset and we need to consider passenger uh, emission. And we actually, uh, one of my uh, master's students, Anastasia, she actually uh, completed this work, looking into pass per passenger uh, greenhouse gas emission per kilometer traveled. So we actually calculate the, the travel distance and what's their emission footprint utilizing nine different transportation modes and also configuring different electricity mix. So, each line here represents a combination between energy pathway and a type of mobility. So you have bus, diesel bus, a battery electric bus using Canada mix, battery electric bus using China electricity mix, private car internal combustion engine, car share internal combustion engine ride share, and then BEV, BEV, and BEV for private car and car share and ride share. The bottom line that if you are investing in uh, ride sharing, battery electric vehicle using the Canadian electric electricity mix. This is the best way, the, the, the core sharing solution. However, you must sustain an occupancy level 
higher than 1.3 passengers for every kilometer traveled. Meaning that if you're driving the core uh, as, as a single occupant uh, uh, user, your emission footprint is actually higher than using an electric bus, despite that the bus is, is, is way heavier and produces more or utilizes more energy. And again, the magic number for the bus is 15 passengers. So if, you, if your bus have more than 15 passenger, passengers on board, this is the ultimate solution to reduce greenhouse gas emission. So if we are speaking from a technology perspective and energy pathway, it makes a lot of sense. If we are, are speaking from an actual mobility modes or transportation modes, uh, car sharing, uh, buses, ride sharing will come ahead of actually uh, uh, private vehicles because of the occupancy of the vehicle and because we need to account for the occupancy of each uh, mode of transportation. So I just wanted to outline these major uh, uh, two questions at the beginning because they will actually uh, link really nicely when we go into the conclusion of the talk. The third one is related to parcel delivery uh, and what's the emission again, similar to a per passenger emission, we calculate per parcel emission. And we see the, the exponential progress of e-commerce, especially during the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. And we, like motivated by this, we started looking into, uh, does it make sense to deliver parcels using drones instead of using ground uh, transportation, either ground EV or ground uh, uh, like a diesel uh, internal combustion engine vans. And you can see the emission, the gray bar here is for uh, rural areas and the black bar here for urban areas because urban is more dense and uh, the vehicle kilometer traveled is way shorter compared to roller. So when we go into comparing this with internal combustion engine van, we cannot even compare at the same board. This is why we created a different Y axis here just to show the number, but we are speaking about 1800 uh, 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 gram CO2 uh, equivalent per parcel delivered compared to 45 for EV ground transportation and 25 for drones based on different uh, air regulations that will actually impact your drone delivery. So bottom line, does it make sense across the three domains, private mobility, uh, buses and drones? The answer is yes, from a utility, from an energy pathway perspective and from an environmental perspective, all three solutions uh, are, are, are encouraged to be implemented in Canada because of the environmental benefits and also to take advantage of made in Canada electricity instead of any imported uh, petrol uh, uh, or refined, refined oils. So what I'm going to share with you is actually what we have achieved so far. Again, by no means I'm trying to say that we, uh, we achieved uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We are a very small cog in a very big machine and we are trying to do our part. And I will split the presentation into the three folds of uh, technology, EV, e-bus, and UAVs. So I started my EV research when I joined uh, uh, McMaster as a postdoc in 2014, and I was privileged to work with uh, uh, Professor Pavlos uh, Canaroglo, who sadly passed away in 2016. And he uh, attracted a massive fund from SHERC and uh, APC is actually allocating to study the social costs and benefits of electric mobility in Canada. So we had the opportunity to collect a national survey uh, twice and each survey had around 20,000 participants. We collected one data set in 2016 and another data set in 2019. And I'm not bragging because I, I was not the one securing the fund, so it was Pavlos that this is the largest data set globally related to understanding consumer preferences, attitude, and socioeconomic demographic characteristics related to electric vehicles. So each data set contains roughly around 10 million data points. And we analyze the data points mainly to understand how the market will evolve from internal combustion engine into pure battery electric vehicle and acknowledging the transition to hybrid electric vehicle and plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. On the right hand side here, you can see the special distribution of our sample across Canada. And then the bar chart, chart looking into the provincial numerical value. And this was weighted sample. So we are actually following the weight of the population density distributed across Canada. The centerpiece of this survey was actually something called the stated preference exercise. 
So as you can see on this image, we present each participant uh, uh, like four of these screens and each screen will give them four vehicle choices. So gasoline, hybrid, plug-in hybrid, and battery electric, and then a set of attributes related to the features of the vehicle. And they have a choice for my replacement vehicle. If they are replacing their existing uh, vehicle, I would choose, and then based on this information, they will select a specific vehicle. And also for additional vehicle, they will select a specific vehicle. There is some limitation to stated preference because you have a discrete set of variables. Each vehicle is configured in a specific way, which I will uh, elaborate uh, more when we go into the second survey. However, it's very effective econometric tool to uh, identify the so-called willingness to pay for different attributes. So out of this survey and using uh, discrete choice models, uh, advanced statistical analyses, we can actually understand what's the willingness to pay by a Canadian consumer for each of the following vehicle attributes related to each of these four categories. And this is exactly what we did. So the, this is why you see all the values in this table uh, uh, associated with the dollar sign. So this is basically the willingness to pay for consumers uh, corresponding to each of the variables. So I will focus mainly on three cash incentives. And as you can see, BEV oriented users, they are willing to match the 1,000, for each $1,000 the government will pay, they are willing to tolerate or pay uh, $1,000 out of pocket or to tolerate an, a $1,000 increase in price of the vehicle price. So in 2016, it made a lot of sense for the government to uh, be very generous with the, uh, with the electric uh, mobility incentives because we can see the effectiveness of, of the incentive program for battery electric vehicle as well as for plug-in hybrid. Another one which was very important looking into electric range for every additional kilometer of battery electric range, they are willing to pay $29. And similarly for PHEV, they are willing to pay $31. And this motivated a lot of uh, uh, automotive manufacturing to offer extended range for their battery. You can actually configure your Tesla based on two different range extended or the standard range. The other one was related to savings and travel time and HOV access. And again, kudos to the, uh, to, to the government. Uh, uh, I'm aware of the program here in Ontario allowing green plates to utilize uh, HOV and HOT lanes. And again, you can see that uh, PHEV users, and specifically, they are willing to pay 2200 more on the vehicle price just to gain uh, access to HOV. And we understand how frustrated the GTHA during peak travel, if you don't use HOV lane, you're, you're kind of doubling your travel time, especially if you're traveling uh, peak morning or peak after. So using the data, we also model what's the probability for different users to uh, go into the technology in Canada with, re with, with respect to space, uh, 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 geography and spatial distribution. So here, a couple of uh, uh, places in, uh, across Canada, and you can see four different colors. Uh, the dark red is actually the probability for buying internal combustion engine, blue probability for uh, hybrid electric vehicle, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle and battery electric vehicle. And as you can see, the majority of Canadian are uh, lower than uh, uh, one, so 10 percent uh, likelihood. There is lower than 10 percent likelihood to buy an electric vehicle in 2016, which was true as we saw the the sales uh, 2017 and 2018 not as forecasted, and it was actually conservative sales compared to places like California or compared to places like Europe and China. So. What we have learned in 2016 and why I'm actually focusing on 2016, uh, given the fact that we have collected the data again in 2019, is actually understanding the consumer uh, market segmentation. So we identified three major categories for battery electric vehicle adopters based on the 2016 data. Uh, the majority of our sample represent typical early adopters, uh, which is actually rich, uh, uh, like small household. They live in, uh, in, uh, in suburb and like in the periphery. They have access to home charging. They have access to garage and driveway. And their household uh, fleet is, is larger than two vehicles. So 
their electric vehicle is more of a luxury or an additional uh, incremental vehicle to their household fleet. And it's not the main household uh, uh, vehicle that they depend on for daily travel. The two surprising categories that came out of the 2016 as emerging uh, market uh, uh, segments or consumer segments, one is emerging early adopters. And we noticed that this is very young generation, very highly educated, and they are at the first stage of their uh, career. Yes, they earn uh, big dollars, but not as big as the typical early adopters. And they are willing to use electric vehicles as their primary uh, household vehicle. However, they live in the urban lifestyle. So you can call them urban executive or urban, uh, let's say millennials or even uh, generation, uh, uh, the one after millen uh, millennials. So the, the one younger than, than millennials. And the second category is, it was also sur very surprising for us, which is related to interested retirees. So like people who saved uh, money during their career and now they are at the, at, at the, the life state that they, they want to treat themselves. So instead of jumping into the higher end uh, German or exotic cars, they are actually shifting to cars like of the Tesla X and Tesla Model S. And these two categories uh, were actually the highest two vehicles uh, mentioned by our respondent. So these three categories, despite the fact that they represented small percentage of our data, and if you multiply this percentage by the probability of ad adoption, which is 10% probability, all of a sudden you'll get like 2.6 and 2.8. However, this was very clear indication that the market is shifting and there is a lot of dynamics happening in the market and we need to keep a very close eye into the market to understand how electric mobility solutions will actually evolve in the Canadian market. So in 2019, we took a decision to actually change our stated preference and instead of constraining consumers to focus on a specific powertrain that we gave to them, we asked them to design their own games. So basically we gave them a design game, each participant will design two games. So in total, we had roughly around 40,000 uh, uh, games. So they design the age of the vehicle, if it's used or new, and like if it's used two years, five years, what's the gasoline range, battery range, and then they go into performance and they can pay cash, lease or finance. And the system will automatically update the cost parameters for them giving these two uh, predefined scenario that public charging infrastructure experience is excellent and they will receive incentives if they are buying new PHEV or BEVs as of like around $14,000 for these two categories. And we configured, like we give them the freedom to configure their cars as, as they want. And then we started looking into the data and it was a, a major surprise to us when we looked into the data. So this is a, an average of the entire 40,000 uh, uh, design games that we completed. And you can see the middle bar here, roughly around 70% of our data is coming as PHEV vehicle. And if we dig a little bit deeper, so we have 77% out of the PHEV vehicles configured the, their electric range is around 85 to 100 kilometer. People feel that they are satisfied with 100 kilometer of electric range and around quarter of the sample, they are satisfied with 50 kilometer uh, electric range. The second major observation that we found in the data is even when you go into the BEV category, there is no agreement on the most suitable battery range when you are actually buying your electric vehicle. And you can see almost equal split starting like from 300 to 400, 300 to uh, 350, 210 to 250, this should be uh, 150 to 210, but uh, like these are, sorry, 425 to 500 kilometer, but again, different uh, uh, demands for different battery sizes are evolving in, in the market, which dictates that automotive industry must offer a wide spectrum of vehicles to satisfy the needs of Canadian consumers when it comes into battery electric vehicle adoption in the market. So we also looked into, okay, so we have these are pure numerical values. So what if people configured their first vehicle as internal combustion engine, and then 
uh, or played with the first vehicle as a uh, uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, and then they actually configure their vehicle as internal combustion engine. So we looked into the change per user for each of the two uh, games, and we tagged them as committed uh, BEV, like people who choose BEV in the two scenarios, committed PHEV, committed HEV, and committed internal combustion engine, and then change its choices, people who will alternate between two different choices. So again, as you can see here, committed PHEV, 60% of the data was 9,887 observations that we observed from the data. The third piece that we also wanted to understand is actually, shall we continue the incentive programs? What will happen if we, if we cut incentives? How incentives might change this accessibility to home charging? So we had three interchangeable variables that will actually change during the design game. Uh, and, and the image that I presented, we had 14,000 uh, uh, incentives and we had uh, public charging experience as excellent. We also have home charging accessibility. So across these 12 different uh, 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 graphs, I, I'm, I'm aware that you cannot read uh, any of the data, but you can easily observe that the tallest bar for each one is actually PHAV. So regardless of the incentive program, so incentive here is zero, $7,000, $14,000, PHEV still dominates the market. So when actually incentives makes a lot of sense, when you couple your incentives with a very good public charging experience and accessibility to home charger. Other than this, there is no return over investment when you actually pay incentives to a battery electric vehicle. So again, Reducing the amount of incentives that you pay for battery electric vehicle uh, will not diminish the sales uh, uh, or the appetite to go for battery electric vehicle and will still have no effect whatsoever on plug-in hybrid electric vehicle because we can see in the market that there is huge desire for plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. I was looking into the sales data for the Matsubishi Outlander and also initial sales for the Toyota Prime plug-in hybrid and both of them, uh, mid-size SUV vehicles, plug-in hybrid, it will give you flexibility of both powertrains, and they are doing fantastic when it comes into the actual sales. Uh, 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 Matsubishi Outlander is the best-selling car in, in England, I think, for uh, five years in a row right now, and like Toyota uh, RAV4 Prime is actually following on the same uh, footsteps. So bottom line that uh, we need to focus on the charging infrastructure, because this, this is when, when we have actually see transition toward battery electric vehicle. And this is actually eating away from the internal combustion engine if we are to achieve the sustainable development goals and promote sustainable transportation. Access to a home charger for uh, uh, multi-unit residential buildings, high-rise multi-unit residential buildings, there is a need to change the regulation and uh, the, the requirement to facilitate charging points within the parking lot in these uh, uh, condos, as well as uh, maybe incentives for home charging for houses. So the key remarks that, that we kind of uh, concluded out of, out of our research uh, uh, on the electric vehicle front, that PHEV market size is expected to grow. And this is unpopular opinion because uh, some of the literature is suggesting that BEV uh, uh, sales will, uh, will, will outperform PHEV. But remember that this is context sensitive. North America, we have a different travel behavior and different travel needs compared to European and other countries. Vehicle size plays a significant role. So I can't wait for the uh, the Ford 150 or all electric or plug-in hybrid vehicle, because again, there is uh, more uh, demand for bigger vehicles in North America compared to uh, other places. Incentives are not as powerful, uh, especially beyond early adopters. So this is a political decision that needs to be considered and also an econometric decision to look into what's the return on investment for uh, providing incentives for uh, battery, so battery electric vehicle compared to providing incentives for the like of electric buses or different sustainable avenues that will achieve the same emission reduction cuts. Charging infrastructure, home infrastructure are mandatory if we need to transition to battery electric vehicle. 
And also I was looking into the Chevy Volt user, uh, usage data, and I noticed that 87% of users reported that they use electric all the modes. So if the, the time they use electric versus uh, diesel versus auto, so you can have the three different configuration, 87% of the time they are driving on the electric power train, which is a great uh, sign uh, on the way people utilize uh, plug-in hybrid vehicle. We have no information whatsoever on the battery degradation and end of life repurposing, refurbishing, recycling. I know there is a question coming, uh, uh, like pre-presentation question coming about uh, battery degradation. And with all honesty, I have no clue whatsoever what how how this will take place. Only time will tell, or maybe an expert in uh, uh, battery recycle will have a better say than me. So. Uh, Shifting into uh, electric buses, we have already established that battery electric buses will achieve substantial uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction per passenger kilometer traveled. So I'm very proud to say that uh, our group at McMaster was uh, one of the, of the very early groups globally to look at electric buses implementation. And I can confidently say that we are the first group in Canada to actually start looking at electric buses. We started our work in 2014 in electric buses. And uh, ever since, we uh, uh, are actually advancing the knowledge uh, on this front. So what we have developed at MEC, uh, uh, again, all credit to uh, uh, the, the research group members, we call it the e-bus orchestrator. So basically, it's, a, it's a, 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 like a, a a simulation platform that will allow you to test and validate and plan for the transition to electric battery electric buses in transit operation using both in route charging technology or overnight charging technology from any supplier nova proterra byd new flyer you name it so we didn't include a fuel cell hydrogen fuel cell or uh, rng uh, renewed natural gas because their powertrain is, is configured in a different way. The simulation platform is based on uh, more than 1 million uh, simulations, and then all the data points are analyzed to understand the, like how we can actually configure our, our, uh, our energy consumption model. And then we validated this energy consumption model against the physical test done uh, by Penn State University. It's called the Altona test uh, track, where they actually subject buses to a uh, very harsh environment and test their energy consumption. So we have five different stages, uh, starting from system level planning, operational planning, financial planning, capacity assessment, and then environmental benefits. And I will show you quickly input output for each one, but the main reason that I am focusing on this one is related to the system level. All these components are done at the system level, which is critical as I will demonstrate later on why we need to study the system, not the component. So this is the, the planning stage when we have data preparation from open source data, energy demand prediction, and then we go into initial route uh, feasibility. Then we simulate uh, energy uh, uh, demand, and this is based on one Hertz uh, speed profile. So this will give us second per second energy consumption rate, assess utility impact assessment, and look into the robustness-based system optimization, looking into cascading failure and uh, uh, resiliency of the system, life cycle cost, fleet procurement, business plan, and then greenhouse gas emission reduction. So all of them are tied together and it's a concurrent platform. So it's not a sequential platform. So it means that each, it, they, it, it goes in a loop. So they keep feeding each other couple of iterations just to make sure that there is a feedback loop embedded in our system. So we tested the system across, uh, I think, five Canadian cities so far, and one in, in the States. The only one that we did the visuals for is uh, Belleville City. And after we did the visual, they actually started operating on demand instead of fixed route buses. So it was uh, a, 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 an off choice. But as you can see, you have the location of the bus uh, per unit of time, and then you have a constant energy consumption for each bus number of trips and you have the charging station data and it will show you if the bus is actually inside the charging station, it will pop up here showing you if the bus is at the charging station. And you can use this and actually mirror this to your actual operation and we get the actual operation from general transit uh, feed specification. 
and from the AVL data, automatic vehicle locator data to understand what is the location of the bus at every given time during the operation day. So uh, why we do this system and why we are not doing route by route analysis, this is a very important question that we need to ask, but I will shift gears into what, what the industry is, is thinking about, how, how they actually perceive battery electric buses and how, how the Canadian municipalities are actually approaching this, uh, uh, this transition. So let's go into why system level analysis. And I, I shaded a couple of uh, the names here just to make sure that I maintain the privacy of the operator. But this is uh, one of the top uh, transit uh, uh, operators or municipalities in the GTHA. And basically, this graph will show you the probability of delay. What's the percentage of the bus coming on time or late or very late or early or very early? Why we need to understand this? Because if you have en route charging uh, station, you need to make sure that you have appropriate time for the bus to charge. Otherwise, the bus will not be able to perform uh, the assigned routes. And therefore, we need to understand what's the probability for the bus coming to this charging point or this stop at time. And as you can see here on time, the highest it gets is actually 87%. And here you can see there are plenty of early arrival. And also you have some percentage here for late arrival. So when, when we actually model the distribution only for probability of delay locking into the distribution, we can see significant, sometimes significant delays happening in the system. So the question is how we can address this if we are planning for electric vehicle? What's the redundancy and safeguard mechanism that we can implement during the design stage to make sure that if the bus is delayed as such, we have safeguards in place to at the end of the day, it, it's at the business of providing transportation means to users. It's not about the vehicle technology. Vehicle technology is our choice, but the end user would like to ride a bus not particularly electric or hydrogen or diesel. Another one which will have significant impact on the energy consumption, how many passengers are on board? So this is only uh, 50 minutes, 7.30 a.m. to 8.21. And you can immediately notice that there is a huge fluctuation on the number of passengers on board. This will impact the weight of the bus, HVAC performance, the amount of time that you open and close the door, which will impact the air circulation and uh, the energy for HVAC. Not only this, when we look at the same route and we look into the same bus operating the same route at three different trips, we immediately notice that the speed profile of the operation is significantly different. Yes, it takes the same pattern and the same shape. However, the speed is not the same. And this is due to the level of service and the congestion uh, across our roadway. So you see the peak time, AM peak, PM peak, and then off peak, and you can see like, like, the, uh, like the delay or, or the speed uh, profile of the system. So we have significant parameters uh, associated with uncertainty and this kind of answers why we need a system level approach because we need to understand, we need to accommodate such uncertainty in our system level design and we will never be able to observe this if we focus on uh, like individual component based evaluation. So we have operation traffic externality, as I mentioned, and again, just to demonstrate, this is also including route topology and all other parameters. So we have uh, like roughly significant amount of gap here that we need to consider. The second one is related to the perspective of municipality, how, how municipalities are actually approaching electric buses. So in 2016, and this is a question uh, that will come later on uh, uh, during the presentation. 2016, we uh, interviewed 12 municipalities uh, and the, the four major parameters came as the guinea pig syndrome, no one willing to be the first kid in the block, technology anxiety, there was an obvious fear about the technology maturity, risk adverse decision process, people are not willing to take any risk with taxpayers' money, and no funding avenues available. In 2022, we are actually doing the same weeks, uh, increasing our sample size. We interviewed 14 so far. So we have political pressure to actually jump to the electrification. Municipalities are now, they fear of missing the fund. It's a available fund, free money. So let's apply for a transformation, transition to electrification without fully understanding the process. 
it's a target driven decision uh, process. So we need to have six buses, six electric buses in our fleet. So let's get them and we will figure it out later how we can actually operate them or utilize them to their potential. Plenty of funding avenues available. So if we connect the dots between what we learned from our simulations and from our uh, system level analysis against what we have observed from the industry, we can bring a, a very clear picture about what's happening in electric transit in Canada. So we figured that uncertainty is a major barrier. However, it's not fully recognized in the industry. Utility integration is a key component. Paying peak charges versus time of use will impact the way you configure your charging station. However, we understand that there is silos in most of the cities. Utility and transit, they don't speak to each other. Uh, E-bus availability, not the range. Uh, availability meaning the, the ratio between charging time and operation time. However, the focus in the industry on the range. System level, not pilots. Uh, again, unfortunately, the fund in Canada is focused tied to pilot. And you cannot generalize pilot as I demonstrated because the same route will have different feature. Resilience and robustness, uh, again, it's not, not even mentioned. Battery degradation and 12 or 18 years uh, life, uh, life cycle of the bus, again, yet to be discovered through the data. So our recommendation uh, for uh, especially uh, people of the audience uh, who actively uh, work at any level of the government that we need, we need to create reference examples for a system level electrification. And instead of spreading the fund too thin, across all municipalities. We need to facilitate a Canadian eBus open source data bank because we strive for actual operation data and every municipality we contact with, they say the data is protected uh, due to the pilot terms and conditions and municipalities must connect with research institute to exchange knowledge. I think we are operating at two different tiers or two different levels and there is huge uh, uh, common benefits for, two, for the two parties if they are actually uh, sit together. So quickly, I'm um, just being aware of, uh, of the time here, uh, just running through uh, the last piece, which is parcel delivery for uh, drones. And again, it's kind of uh, the motivation for parcel delivery. It's the same work that we did on the buses, but instead of doing this in a 2D environment, we are actually doing this in a 3D environment. So this is the, the, main, the main difference, or uh, we were so, so naive to think, to think so. So basically, uh, the current practice in, in drones is focusing on component optimization in a single domain. To make this very simple, people are focusing what's the energy consumption relative to drone size or how we can optimize drone charging stations for parcel delivery. However, we use 2D or they use 2D environment. Here, I'm not trying to criticize the existing work. It's published in very high impactful journal, Transportation Research Report CND. However, I'm still saying that system level is way more important and insightful compared to component level analysis. Uh, again, I don't want to repeat myself. If you don't analyze this as a system, you don't get a system level evaluation. You will not understand or capture the cascading impact and resiliency and the true costs and benefits leading to inaccurate decisions will not be observed if you focus on components. And to prove this point, this is downtown Toronto. We modeled uh, 330 parcel delivery and we just changed the proximity to buildings. So distance, uh, permissible distance to buildings. Here, this is lean distance. Drones can fly very close to building, uh, buildings and people. This is medium or average. This is very strict. And you can immediately see the impact on the energy consumption of the drone, AKA, if you have a strict distance, you have more energy consumption, more greenhouse gas emission, and sometimes you have failed missions. So the zero here represents failed mission. The, uh, uh, the solution is infeasible. You cannot actually deliver the parcel using drone. So the policy energy nexus is very important. Similarly, the way you explore or the way you navigate your aerospace, the type of algorithm that you use for aerospace uh, wayfinding will have significant impact on the trajectory of your, of your drone. So these are five of the top uh, uh, algorithm used in the industry, ASTOR, Digestra, Dynamic, Window, Potential Field, and RRT. And you can see the corresponding altitude of your drone resulting from each of these algorithms. So again, which one to pick from and uh, how this might impact the entire system. 
So our quest or what we are doing right now is uh, trying to create a digital twin model for the city of Toronto to replicate uh, the physical infrastructure and advocate for a fully independent parcel delivery system using drones coupled with uh, solar uh, energy harnessing from uh, uh, like building facades instead of the, the high glazed building facades and, and install uh, uh, like solar panels and uh, uh, harvest the energy to feed the drone system. So we will follow the trend in the literature components. However, it's multiple domains and looking into an entire system. This is our modeling platform. Again, same as the buses, we model one end and then we validate our modeling again. So this loop is essential to uh, allow the software to learn through its mistake and advance the accuracy level of the software. Uh, again, open source data, static data and dynamic data, population density, 3D GIS maps, which is available, open street maps, weather, and a lot of uh, static data. And then we get into LiDAR data, no fly zone, especially in Toronto because of the Toronto downtown airport construction zones because of the, of the cranes uh, move, movement downtown Toronto. This is basically the peak hour parcel demand modeled as a function of the population density and building heights in the city of Toronto. You can see all the red dots are actually parcel demands. And on the left, you see the building heights uh, for the city of Toronto. Acknowledging that drones have a, a, a specific uh, air, like air maneuverability. So we need to make sure that whenever they uh, uh, fly around buildings, they can do the tight turns because as you can see at the lower graph here, they cannot do tight angles all of a sudden. So this is why we configure our uh, explored airspace as a dynamic mesh. So it will change based on the proximity to buildings. And then we go into the uh, sky discretization morphology. And this is, I think the centerpiece for people working in, in uh, uh, like Transport Canada, Ministry of Transportation, any work related to drone industry, this is the, the must do to do item, which type of uh, uh, airspace discretization morphology to be adopted because this will have severe impacts on the way we configure our system. So what we did, we compared, we proposed a, a, a model called sky route discretization. Uh, and this is the Cartesian discretization approach, which basically allowed drones to fly through the entire uh, uh, airspace and you can see the difference immediately. So all, uh, this is 5 p.m. around 12,500 uh, uh, mission or deliveries. And uh, all of them are successful. However, when you look into uh, this, the so-called Euler angles, which will give you the, the three angles for the drone and proximity drone to drone to better, you can actually get a lot of information related to the safety or potential of collision energy consumption, because every time the drone will change its direction, it, it, it will actually use some th thrust, which uh, translates into energy. And as a byproduct, this will translate into emission. So when you go into the sky route, the dark dots, you will see the Euler angles at the lower end. When you go into the Cartesian grid, you will see the Euler angles are actually at the higher end, meaning that despite the fact that both models will deliver the 12,500 trips, there is significant energy consumption variation and potential of collision and accident uh, between the two systems. So the last point, we modeled uh, solar energy uh, harnessing at the downtown Toronto, and then uh, encapsulated parcel delivery, uh, charging pads at the rooftop, and then solar exposure. And you can see here at the, this 3D render that the pink rooftops are potential locations and the green rooftops are actually not potential locations for charging because they don't have enough solar exposure. And then we optimize the entire system to make sure that we have 100% coverage for the city of Toronto. And this is the number that I would like to communicate with you that if you model this system as an integration between uh, solar powered BIPV upgrade of the buildings, in addition to drone, you are actually subtracting greenhouse gas emission by almost 1 million uh, gram, which ton CO2 equivalent per day by just shifting your operation. This is massive uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction, uh, especially for considering that you are delivering around 12,500 uh, uh, drones. So uh, tying things together, I am just checking my time here. I have very few minutes left. 
So big picture perspective, uh, yes, we can achieve significant greenhouse gas emission through e-mobility. Systemic analysis is mandatory. It's not a luxury, it's not an option. Uh, electric mobility translates to electric and mobility, two domains. Uh, I learned a lot about the utility grid just to be able to walk uh, or even crawl uh, around the utility parameters. And I work uh, uh, very closely with professors from electric engineering just to understand. Investment and in skills development program is required to get our low hanging fruit for the parallel industries to electric mobility, equity inclusion and incentives and fund. Why you don't see a similar incentive programs for buses compared to the incentive program for battery electric vehicle? This is a, 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 an interesting question. And then opportunity for made in Canada e-mobility supporting the economy with the skill sets that we have in the country. From an R&D perspective, uh, uh, we are just at the beginning of the transportation. Uh, just for, for reference point, Green Shield Fundamental Relationship Diagram, which was incepted in 1934, is still at use for the highway capacity manual that we use in 2023 and, and 22. So it's almost 100 years and we still use. So transportation, our time scale is, is very slow. Uh, scale migration to, due to the fund. We have a lot of scale migration to the US due to the lack of funding. So we need to speak about this. And then uh, very excited for any research collaboration. And on this note, uh, I bring it back to uh, Jessica. And hopefully I didn't uh, overstep my time limit. And you can scan this QR code to get my contact information. So back to you, Jessica. That's great. Thank you very much. And thank you for sharing your contact info. We had a few people asking how they could uh, touch base with you. So that's great. Um, so if you're watching and you uh, want to contact Dr. Mohammed, just scan the QR code. I'm sure I can share your contact information and in a follow up email as well if needed. So um, with that, now we have a couple minutes for Q and A. Um, we had some pre submitted questions. Um, so if you want to start with maybe um, the first couple and sure then, yeah and then we had a couple if you do have a question for dr mohammed you can type it in the q a uh, button use at the bottom of your screen we have a couple in there right now but we'll start with these ones and we'll just um, see how we're doing for time okay so uh, basically uh, half of them i have no clue whatsoever how i can answer them so how far along are we with cleaning up air travel my question is commercial or lost mile i have no knowledge whatsoever about commercial when it comes into last mile delivery, uh, there is like all the big companies are investing, Amazon, Airbus, uh, 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 Boeing, uh, what, what else, uh, uh, DHL, all of them are throwing big dollars into drone delivery. And now it's, it's like it will take place if you, if you look at to uh, uh, progressive uh, countries like uh, United Arab Emirates, they have a, a pro just approved pizza delivery in Abu Dhabi a couple of weeks ago. So it's happening. That's the, the question when it will happen in Canada. So no clue whatsoever. So please comment on the safe battery storage with said vehicles and the battery life decay and uh, uh, disposal of all batteries. Honestly, I, I, it's completely out of, uh, I will be out of depth if I, if I made any comments on this question. So apologies for this. So what's the biggest challenge for adoption of sustainable transportation, technological, economical, social, or legal? I'll say uh, we need to acknowledge that we are not comparing Apple to Apple when it comes to electric mobility versus traditional mobility. So we, when we transition from uh, like uh, horse, uh, uh, like carriages to cars, we changed our standards and, and roads. So it makes a lot of sense that we re revisit our uh, manuals, standards, and guidelines to facilitate the transition to electric mobility. So I will say uh, uh, political guidelines and uh, standardization is the biggest hurdle. From a social perspective, there is a, 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 like a, a good appetite to transition to sustainable transportation. And again, sustainable transportation is not an uh, exclusive to electric mobility. Active transportation is sustainable. Public transportation is sustainable. And the technology now is in favor of sustainable transportation in fact, so I think if we have the, the legal, political standardization uh, sphere aligned, I think all the other parameters will follow. Do you, do you think the price of electric cars will come down? Definitely. Uh, uh, yes, because like, as we can see, uh, when I started doing this research, it was 15 
1500 per uh, kilowatt hour energy storage system. Now it's, uh, it's almost 250. So drop down in, in five years, drop down significantly and we expecting so. However, it, it's not, it, again, the, the, like, do we have a market monopoly? This is a big question. What's the automotive industry uh, perspective about lowering the prices? Increased gas prices is actually uh, working in our favor because you can see the electric vehicle and uh, hybrid and plug-in hybrid sales are, are getting up. So what would be the return on government investment uh, drivers to go electric? Yep, I, I for nodding drivers to go electric. This is very interesting question because if we need to reap the benefits of the government investment, we need to look into what's the parallel economy for electric mobility. And parallel economy, I mean human resources, I mean training uh, uh, mechanics. Mechanics are very, very uh, rare commodity in Canada when it comes into electric power trains. And also looking into uh, uh, like the, the, the electric uh, uh, industry, like batteries, uh, looking into uh, uh, battery uh, uh, decommissioning, refurbishing or repurposing. So all these parallel industries will benefit from our transition. I know that there is some job losses will, will take place in the traditional automotive industry. However, there is uh, Professor Atif Kabursi, I think, in, in the School of Business at McMaster. He, he, he's a brilliant professor when it comes into uh, economics and understanding the dynamics of the market. And based on discussion, so uh, uh, needs to be validated by him, that overall the net job gains from the transition to electric vehicles, uh, for example, will actually favor electric vehicles uh, and will favor the Canadian economy. So I, I think uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, this kind of partially answered the question. So will hydrogen play a part uh, in larger transportation system? I believe so, uh, especially with the, with, the, with the current range of electric buses. Hydrogen fuel cell is expected to play a major role, especially for uh, roller operation and longer routes, because, uh, because it's, uh, it's, it's very challenging for battery electric buses, especially in winter condition, higher occupancy and uh, uh, like uh, a, a pavement condition during the winter. All of these factors will impact on the energy consumption. How do you overcome the North American love of the car? I wish I have the answer. I lived in Italy and England for uh, five years. Uh, I had my car just for the weekend. Italy, no car, all public transit. England, I had my car just for the weekend. I had my bike for, for the entire week. And when I came to Canada, I, like, I took a decision to bike. Took me exactly two months. Then I got my first car. Now we have two cars in the household because the way the city is especially scattered it kind of dictates cars movement. I was surprised when I see in Hamilton that we have free parking downtown on the weekend. I said, okay, let's like a, a different in Europe. It's you, you pay a fortune for parking downtown. So this is why it's park and drive most of the time. So next question, do you see electric buses better than LRT? Uh, I assume that this is uh, related to the Hamilton. And again, uh, electric buses are a technology choice. LRT is a service mode. So LRT is a second order transit solution, which means that when you reach a specific uh, volume uh, or demand on transit system, you must upgrade. So you go from traditional to express to BRT to LRT to uh, 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 underground to uh, rail. So from uh, uh, like the perspective of transportation, not a technology choice, LRT makes a lot of sense. And also from a sustainable development uh, goals perspective, LRT is very clean because it's an electricity based uh, uh, solution. So I will, I will say uh, uh, LRT, given the demand across this corridor, the B line in Hamilton, it makes more sense compared to electric buses. So last question, I studied your and paper, what hinders the adoption of a bus? What are the main barriers that still exist 2022? Uh, again, as presented uh, in, in a previous slide, it's, uh, it's the way the uh, transit industry is being pressured to achieve specific environmental targets without handed enough resources to do the due diligence uh, uh, to understand the technology. Most of them are doing fantastic job and kind of like turning every, every stone and looking for papers and reaching out. However, we shouldn't be a target driven uh, process. We should be an like implementation based process. How we can successfully implement the technology 
not implemented the technology in a specific timeline. To give a small example here, uh, uh, the typical life, uh, 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 bus life is 12 years, 12 to 18. Some people will, will, will have the bus for 18 years. So if you have a specific target, it means that you might need to decommission active buses just to reach your target, which is a, a waste of resources. When you think about that, I have a bus for eight years, now I need to replace it because I have a target to achieve a specific bus. Again, I'm not saying that the, that the political support is wrong. Uh, I'm actually, this year, uh, the political environment toward better electric buses shifted significantly to the positive side, but I, I still believe it requires a bit of tweaking to, uh, to kind of take advantage of uh, electrification of transit. And by the way, transit moves around 22 million Canadians every day. So when you think about it, it's a major asset in, in our, and we have, we have uh, some of the huge manufacturers in, in Canada. Similarly, in drones, when, when you look into some of the companies like D Drone Delivery Canada based in Mississauga, again, like, like all these uh, industries will actually, will actually favor uh, the transition towards sustainable mobility. So I have two questions on, on the chat. Uh, do, yeah. we, do, do we still have time to answer? Yeah, I think okay. we have time to answer these two. These will be our okay. final two. Perfect. So do you think that the transportation infrastructure of developing countries can be updated for clean transportation system just as easily? Sometimes, uh, yes, the answer, short answer, yes, because sometimes the lack of uh, infra existing infrastructure will actually ease the transition. So if you are building infrastructure for the first time and uh, uh, coming from uh, uh, like, uh, like a developing country myself. So sometimes it's easier to build uh, for the updated infrastructure uh, to start with. So a lot of the cities that actually growing uh, uh, or, or majorly uh, upgraded in, in, in other countries are actually being upgraded to the specs of sustainable mo mobility. And we are all uh, uh, impressed when we see like, like uh, the amount of charging stations in cities like Dubai, when you go into New Cairo, I was looking into the master plans and all of them favor active transportation modes, the monorail and, and all other electric based solutions. So I will say, yeah, it, it might be easier, but the fund is a big, a big question here. So another question is, uh, in a battery electric bus, how much the number of charging, this charging cycle impact on battery life? Based on based on your uh, the specs of the bus, so you, we have a significant range of battery specs. I think the largest we have is coming from Portera, uh, which will get you up to 350 kilometers of range, and the smallest coming from Nova, I think 80 uh, kilowatt hour. So number of cycles will actually impact uh, the degradation process of your battery because it's 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 like uh, pure math. How many cycles you charge this charge, and uh, also, it will it will impact the efficiency of the bus. So, if you're starting by 100% efficiency, and after like let's say a million cycle, now you are operating at 90% efficiency. Do you have enough juice in your battery to sustain your operation? And this is again, this is a testimony to the system level evaluation and uncertainty. So, if you plan your system to the edge, what will happen if your battery performance? Uh, 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 decrease. And we all experience this in our phones and our laptop and iPads, you name it. That when you buy the product first year, it's fantastic. The first uh, update, software update, and all of a sudden you lose a couple of hours on your laptop. So a couple of hours in transit operation, it's a public service uh, uh, system. It means that your system will collapse. You will not be able to actually deliver people to their jobs or to like productivity wise will it, it will be a major issue. So the question for us as researchers, we should acknowledge this and we should plan for this. And we should put the guidelines and standards to draw the line and say, be 5% transit uh, agencies should have a warranty for their battery. And this is how we can actually uh, inform uh, the, tra the transformation process. That's great. Thank you so much. What a wonderful presentation, lots of information to absorb. So thank you for um, taking time out of your busy schedule to speak to our group today. And thank you everyone online for joining us. Following the webinar, you'll receive an email link to a survey. If you can kindly take a minute to fill it out, we appreciate the feedback. 
Part two of our UN Sustainable Development Goal number 11 Logger Lecture Series will take place on Tuesday, June 14th, as Dr. Jim Dunn will discuss urban health geography and the link between access to secure, stable housing and health. So stay tuned for more information and registration on that webinar in the coming weeks. And then for finally, for um, any information on our upcoming alumni events, please visit our website at alumni.mcmaster.ca, which we will put in the chat here briefly. And uh, just to, once again, Dr. Mohamed, thank you so much for taking your time um, to give this lecture to us this evening. And um, I will follow up with an email to all of our registrants with contact information um, as well. So thank you. And okay, I hope you all you. enjoyed I'm, the rest of your evening. And, and thank you, everyone. And thank you, uh, Jessica, for the invitation. Wonderful. Have a great evening. You too as well.